We can stop HIV, Iowa. One key step, getting tested for HIV. An estimated 14% of people in Iowa living with HIV don't know their status. The CDC recommends everyone get tested for HIV at least once in their lifetime or more often when needed. So testing is important. Yes. Testing is the only way to know your status. It's the first step in getting additional HIV prevention services or HIV care. Find out more at StopHIVIowa.org. This is LBC with Nick Abbott. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. We are talking in this hour about how fair it is to make parents who send their children to private school pay a bit more tax for doing so, because at the moment they are uh, tax-exempt for certain uh, taxes, private schools. 0345 6060 973. Back to your calls on that subject in a moment. But first, Simon Marks is LBC's US correspondent and joins us now from Washington, D.C. Hello, Simon. Evening, Nick. So, Joe Biden was having an event to celebrate the passage of a federal gun safety law. Um, it didn't go well, did it? It did not go well at all. This is the new, very limited package of laws that was uh, agreed to by Democrats and Republicans up on Capitol Hill just a couple of weeks ago after uh, some pretty fevered negotiations. At one point, the Republicans walked out, then they came back into the talks, and they uh, ended up embracing a diluted, very watered-down package of measures vastly different than the measures that the House of Representatives had passed and favoured so this that this set of laws does not for example include raising the age at which you can go and buy uh, an assault rifle from 18 to 21 what it does is expand background checks it puts money into additional mental health resources uh, particularly for schools and it also uh, puts more money into school safety so it's a real mix of uh, kind of uh, hot button issues on the subject favoured by Republicans with the Democrats' insistence that background checks need to be expanded. Uh, you know, it is a very restrictive package of measures. It is also the first time in decades that Democrats and Republicans have been able to forge any kind of a compromise over uh, guns on Capitol Hill. And that is what President Biden was seeking to celebrate in the Rose Garden today uh, when things went uh, very much awry for him. Take a listen. Today's many things is proof that despite the naysayers, we can make meaningful progress on dealing with gun violence. Because make no mistake, sit down, you'll hear what I have to say. If you think you... The heckler, a bereaved father by the name of Manuel Oliver. I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm here. I'm here. Let me finish my comment. Let him talk. Let him talk. No one... Okay? Because, make no mistake about it, this legislation is real progress, but more has to be done. The provision of this new legislation is going to save lives. Optically, this was very uncomfortable for the president and for some of those people in the crowd who tried to drown out the protestations of Mr. Oliver, who lost his 17-year-old uh, son in the mass shooting at Marjorie uh, Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, uh, he wanted to convey the message to President Biden that he, you could hear him there say, he's been trying to convey to the president for years that more needs to be done to crack down on guns. And after he left the White House, escorted off the premises, uh, he made his way to a, a CNN television studio where he explained uh, what his position is on gun control in the United States and why he believes the Biden administration isn't doing enough to get there. This is like um, giving a green light to Congress to wait another 30 years to do something else. But guess what? We're not going to let that happen. And anyone that thinks that this is a new start, a new beginning, is probably showing that we can slow down our activism. Not me, 
not Joaquin, not my wife Patricia, and not the thousand of kids that are out there. Joaquin is uh, the name of the son that died in the Parkland shooting. I mean, all of this again sort of served to demonstrate that on issues like gun control, we talked yesterday about the issue of abortion, President Biden is somewhat out of touch uh, with grassroots activists. And uh, since we spoke yesterday, Nick, we've now seen new polling uh, today that shows the president's approval rating down to a record low of 33%. And in the poll that was conducted for the New York Times, 64% of Democrats are now saying they do not believe Joe Biden should seek re-election in 2024. Yeah, the, um, the, the gun laws that were passed, I mean, the, the, the scale of the challenge was uh, somewhat laid bare because 16 days after the gun law was passed, a gunman in Illinois, a place called Highland Park, killed yeah. seven people and wounded 30 others at the Independence Day parade. So it's, it seems unlikely that this uh, new law is going to make the slightest bit of difference. I mean, you have to remember... It's, it's incredible to think. In America, there's a mass shooting every day. There have been more mass shootings this year than days of the year in the United States. And when President Biden says, as he said there, that this package of laws is going to save hundreds, maybe thousands of lives, I mean, yes, it, they will save some lives, but it's a tip of the iceberg given the scale of the issue that the country faces. That Highland Park shooting in Illinois on July the 4th was one of only three incidents on July the 4th. It attracted all the attention because, of course, of the size of the death toll. But there was another mass shooting in Gary, Indiana, that I think claimed three lives. There were two police officers who were hurt as uh, gunfire rained down on them in Philadelphia in the middle of the July the 4th fireworks display. Uh, and, you know, what kind of a country can't celebrate its own birthday without not one but multiple mass shootings it's a monumental problem and uh, joe biden's problems don't end there because his uh, son has been in the news for uh, um well you tell me I yes well, I mean, his son is is constantly in the news, uh, but the, these latest uh, claims uh, relate to allegations that Hunter Biden uh, spent $30,000 on escorts over a five-month period. Uh, this is not recent. This dates back several years. Uh, and the uh, suggestion is that if the federal authorities conclude that he transported prostitutes across state lines as some of the documents and texts and videos that are out there suggest he could face federal charges because you can't as uh, Jeffrey Epstein found out and uh, Ghislaine Maxwell has found out you can't traffic people across state lines uh, to engage in illegal sexual activity without running the risk of facing federal charges. Now, Hunter Biden has been a persistent problem uh, for his father, Joe Biden, because of uh, Republican efforts to uh, amplify uh, allegations entirely unproven that Hunter Biden was engaged in corrupt business practices uh, in Ukraine and China. There's also been the issue, of course, of his uh, missing laptop, uh, which absolutely was his laptop and absolutely has turned up and does appear to uh, contain an array of uh, difficulties uh, on its hard drive that uh, Biden Jr. at some point is going to have to find a way of explaining. Uh, and uh, the White House has really found itself on the back foot over this over the last uh, couple of weeks because it has insisted, for example, on the issue of um, allegations that there were corrupt business practices going on in China, that at no point did President Biden ever discuss this with Hunter Biden, but there has been audio found of a voicemail message that certainly sounds like President Biden placing a call to his son and conveying to him the fact that he had read an article, uh, sort of an advanced uh, version, early version of an article in the New York Times uh, about uh, what had been going on in China and that he, President Biden, thought that uh, it suggested that Hunter Biden was 
in the clear and the White House has refused to comment on how you can say that there was no communication between these two men when that voicemail has turned up. So it's a nagging problem for the president and, you know, these, these latest more lurid um, uh, uh, allegations are only going to complicate things. Meanwhile, on the other side, the, uh, the clown show continues. Steve Bannon is going to be... Has it started yet or is he about to be on trial for contempt of Congress? Uh, that starts next week and the Department of Justice says that Steve Bannon's uh, last-minute decision uh, to testify before the House Select Committee that is digging into the events of January the 6th of last year, the uprising by Donald Trump supporters, his agreement now to testify does not prevent him from continuing to face contempt of Congress charges. Uh, Steve Bannon is due to be testifying uh, to the committee, we think, later this week. He said he wanted to do it in public after he secured a letter from Donald Trump uh, waiving executive privilege. Executive privilege is that, that bit of the communication between the president and uh, an employee of the White House uh, that is covered by uh, privilege claims, and therefore you don't have to testify about what you said to the president right. or what the president said to you. The thing is, Steve Bannon wasn't an employee of the White House at the time of January the 6th and in the run-up to it. So it's never been entirely clear that executive privilege actually applied. Uh, he says he wants to testify in public because there's nothing Steve Bannon likes more than throwing some incendiary bombs mm. uh, in public. Uh, and uh, he would love the opportunity uh, to try and bedevil particularly Liz Cheney, the dissident Republican on the uh, committee who's kind of the lead prosecutor. The committee seems more minded to have him testify in private, on video, but in private, uh, because I think they definitely sense uh, that he's up to something. So Donald Trump then must be quite confident that Steve Bannon is still on his side. I, I think Donald Trump should be supremely confident that Steve Bannon is on his side. I mean, he always uh, has been on his side, even when they had that falling out and Steve Bannon uh, was fired from the White House. They continued talking throughout. And, I mean, Steve Bannon is a dyed-in-the-wool believer. He is the Rasputin figure here. He's, he's the Dominic Cummings uh, in terms of uh, putting Donald Trump into the White House. And uh, the idea that he would turn against uh, Donald Trump, given the uh, absolute role that Steve Bannon played in the run-up to January the 6th, you know, really giving directions to Donald Trump supporters to come to Washington and, as Bannon put it, fight like hell. Uh, I, I mean, the idea that he would abandon Donald Trump at this point, I think, is, uh, is, is uh, a fiction. It's just not going to happen. And neither, maybe, will uh, happen the takeover of Twitter by Elon Musk. And there's a suggestion that if he doesn't go through with this deal, he might go to jail. Yeah, when it this, comes this, to reducing this, sugar oh, in your family's diet... That. Hang on one the second, we don't want to hear that at all. This comes from uh, CNBC. No, I want to hear more about you sugar in my diet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this comes from uh, CNBC, uh, the business channel here, uh, that had a host today suggesting... Uh, that Elon Musk could well end up in jail because uh, the argument is that he made a, a $44 billion offer to buy Twitter. Uh, there, there are legal documents governing that offer, and you can't simply back out because you say they haven't provided you with the evidence to support their claims about the number of fake uh, accounts uh, that exist on the platform when, in fact, Twitter has actually provided you with what they call the fire hose. I mean, absolute total access to raw data about the uh, company's uh, activities every day and what takes place on that social media platform. So there's absolutely no doubt that this is completely heading for the court. And some analysts today were suggesting that Elon Musk could be in sub some substantial legal jeopardy with the possibility of facing uh, criminal charges, especially given, and, and, and you know, we, we addressed this a bit last night, you know, the fact that, that uh, Elon Musk is 
uh, a shareholder in Twitter. Mm. And so all of this uh, that he's been doing in terms of raising the possibility of buying it, then raising questions about whether he would, then backing out, uh, runs the risk of attracting the attention of regulators at the Securities and Exchange Commission who might wonder if some of the things that he was doing uh, could be construed as an effort to impact Twitter's share price in which he has uh, something of an interest. Yes, he does. Uh, it doesn't get boring. Simon, thanks Never so much does. for your time. Cheers, Nick. Simon Marks, LBC's US correspondent, joining us there from Washington, D.C. We can stop HIV, Iowa, and it all starts with health equity. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. To achieve this, we need to remove obstacles to good health. Poverty and discrimination support an environment in which HIV thrives. We must work together so that all Iowans have access to the resources they need to prevent, diagnose, and treat HIV. Visit StopHIVIowa.org.